Hi, and welcome to Mind Shifters Radio with the Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael Rice, and I'm your co-host, Jeannie Rice. We welcome you to our show midweek, and our call-in number is 646-200-4169. Press 1, that puts you in queue to talk to us. We already have a hand up. We would love to hear your comments and your questions because this is your show. Welcome to the show. Hi, Michael. Hey, sweetie. Delight to be here. We have another beautiful day in Theodosia, Missouri, where we're doing the show from. Uh, we'll be doing the show for a couple more days from here. Our, uh, on Friday, we'll uh, probably be doing, well, we'll still be doing it Friday, but Monday we'll be in St. Louis, so, so or actually DeSoto, Missouri, up near St. Louis. So we're delighted to be here, delighted to have the opportunity and the blessing of uh, presenting the Ancient Aramaic Tools of Forgiveness. Our work is simple. Let's get an accurate definition of a human life. Hold a newborn child, you know exactly what it is. There aren't enough words to describe human life. And so hold a newborn, you've got a direct experience. Now, understand that that's what you are. You are that awesome presence of love. If you've lost contact with that, If that awesome presence of love in you has been buried by some form of hostility or fear, know that you have fallen into the trap of the world of the brainwash of making us think that hostility and fear will get us somewhere and get us what we want. It's insane and it won't. And the cost of living out of hostility and fear is your human life. And there are all kinds of cons, all kinds of stories, all kinds of ways, all kinds of nice words of having people be in hostility and fear and believe that they're really on track because their righteous indignation is right and therefore they're justified in whatever viciousness or violence or condemnation or guilt they're about to lay on somebody. But the thing we forget when we do that is that we're laying that hostility, fear, grief, guilt, and pain judgment, condemnation on ourselves first. And when we fall into the trap of doing that, we just gave up our human lives. This work is about restoring this to our human lives, that there is zero excuse in the world for giving up the awesome presence of love, your human life. Whatever's going on outside of you, whatever's going on inside of you, there is zero excuse. And I have a, 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 piece of, a piece of teaching that I was given this morning. I was actually in that sort of dream state. That's where I get a lot of uh, direct contact and direct information. And what I was shown in this dream was I was, I was in a courtroom, and I was being uh, introduced by the opposing counsel to the jury. And the opposing counsel was very righteous and in, indignant about the issue. We don't have to go into the issue. It was a trial, but was very righteous and indignant about how wrong and how evil the person was that was on trial. And I was a witness. And I was a witness for that person. And they introduced me as being, you know, every negative word in the book you could think of, every word that you could think to condemn somebody was part of the introduction to the jury so that they'd be biased against me. You know, I was, you know, well, just every word they could think of. And before I got on the stand, I had to take a quick bathroom break. And as I was coming back from the bathroom, what I was guided to do, this is in the dream, what I was guided to do was to put forward the fact that in this, court battle, there were two opposing sides. Now, of course, two opposing sides would seem to me, would seem to be the, you know, the person who's accused and the person who's doing the accusing, but that wasn't the two opposing sides. And to me, it was such a powerful way to understand and express human life. And what I was shown was that there were two opposing sides in the conflict. One side was those who would live as the active presence of love. 
that is, those who were on God's side. The other side were both the accused and the accuser who were in hostility and fear. So the accuser with all their righteous language and they were right and the other person was wrong and and, 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 the fact that they were in some form of attack mode meant that they were on the opposing side to the creator. So whenever we're in our righteous anger, our righteous indignation, we're on the incorrect side. We're on the side of the game that we don't want to be on as human beings. And the work of forgiveness is how to remove those brainwashes, those cons that have been put into our mind that have us think that our righteous anger is just what we need in order to bring change into the world. Righteous anger is something that makes the mind stupid. All forms of anger make the mind stupid. The only right use of anger is to forgive it. So we introduced the concept of forgiveness, and forgiveness has nothing to do with I let you off the hook for what's happening inside of me. If I'm in pain or turmoil, if I'm in righteous indignation, righteous anger, all those things that people use to justify their rage and their guilt trips and their laying it on somebody else, if I'm in that, then I'm in error. I'm in opposition to the creator. And forgiveness is the tool with which I go inside myself and I remove that piece of brainwash so that I function as a human being. I function as the active presence of love no matter what's going on. So that's our invitation to you. If you're not familiar with what we're talking about, this process of forgiveness, you know, the Greeks taught us that all you need to do is forgive is to forgive is just let them off the hook. It's all their fault that you're in pain anyway. They made you angry. They made you sad. They did it to you. That's the biggest lie that's ever existed. Nobody can make you feel anything that isn't inside of you. And if you're feeling it, then you can rest assured that it belongs to one person and one person only, and that's you. And there's no righteous use of that which is off the mark, that which takes you out of the active presence of love. The first order of business is you want to be restored to the active presence of love. Before you open your mouth about any circumstance or situation in life, you want to be on God's side, on the creator's side. You want to be on the side of the active presence of love. Then, out of a mind of love, address everything that's out of place in your world, and you will be empowered a thousand times more powerfully than you would be to speak out of any kind of righteous anything. How do you do that, Michael? Well, Go to our website, www.whyagain.org, and in the upper left-hand corner, that's our new website, you'll see a little link in blue letters, tiny blue letters that say, start here. Click that link. It'll give you the whole forgiveness process, all of our worksheets. It'll give you a place to begin with the how-to of forgiveness, how to remove everything that never belongs in your structure. And what never belongs in your structure is anything unlike your human life. So that's what we're here to share with you and how to do that. Go to the website, download the worksheet. There are several radio shows where we walk you through the process. And then as you begin to use the process on your own and questions come forward, things that don't make sense because it's a totally different way of thinking than the world thinks, then we're here to support you five days a week. That's why we're here. Our call-in number is 646 4169 Let's get to our first caller. Jeannie? All right. We actually have two callers. The first one, I think, might be Caroline. Area code 541, you're on the air. Hi there, Michael and Jeannie. It's Carolyn. And, hey there, young uh, lady. How do you do? As long as you call me young, I'm okay. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to tell you that uh, last night or yesterday some afternoon, uh, Julie <clears throat> helped me with the most profound worksheet that I've done ever. And it was all perfect because I was on the phone yesterday when the man spoke of uh, not having abundance, money in his life, and that, you know, you responded that he didn't deserve it. Well, that really, I really saw 
that for myself on every single level that that's how I grew up, that I let me, didn't deserve Let me see if I understand you correctly. So what you heard me say is that his issue was that he didn't deserve it. You didn't hear me saying that I felt he didn't deserve it. No, he didn't deserve it. That that was the issue that he was working with, the not deserving it. Correct. Okay, cool. So what happened in your worksheet? Tell us about it. Well, my parents, especially my mother, was extremely abusive. Uh, She basically called me ugly every day. And basically, and she actually said that uh, until I was about 18, 19 um, she'd introduced me that way. Must have been pretty uh, sad when she felt about herself. Right. And uh, Are you the message is what? Are you breathing? No. <laughs> the messages I got were that I would never amount to anything. Uh and the other thing, my father never stopped her. So I never felt any protection whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was over and over and over that I was moody, that I walked like my father, I talked like him, whatever feeling she had about him, I was always wrong. So... I remember feeling like I don't belong here. Mm. And I remember Feels like a lot of grief. Oh my God. And I would now, walk please, by please, please. Oh, 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 hold on, hold on. <laughs> let's stay out of your head for a minute and let's go into that feeling of grief. Let's be with it. Okay. Okay. So just breathe, just breathe and let yourself feel that grief of feeling like you didn't belong and there's nothing but rejection here. Well, wow, that's just huge. Whew. And you've carried this around all your life, for, so for the last right. 38 years, right? <laughs> well, more than that. How I'm about more to than be that 70. when you're only 38? Yeah, I'm about to be 78. And Whoa! It, and it was like maybe 12 years ago, I don't remember, that I started seeing myself in the mirror and saying, you're not ugly, you're pretty. Mm. But I never felt accepted. I never felt like I belonged. And I could never, never, never express any of my, any of my feelings. So I stuck them, all of them, every single one inside of myself. And then I married this man who was paranoid schizophrenic. And so I went from one abusive relationship into another. And, of course, I was always wrong with him. And, And of course, you resonate to somebody who could reinforce your image of yourself as being not worthy and ugly and all those right. things. Yeah. Right, which is what happened. And so isn't that I... awesome? Isn't that awesome how you were able to be pulled into situation after situation to get to look at this and forgive it? Right. And isn't it awesome that here you are at 78 years of age saying, I'm ready to give that one up. Finally, oh, so how many funny. times has life kicked me? In, how many times has life kicked me in the limitation around that one? How many why is this happening to me again experiences have I had? It's like too many, right? Oh, Michael, it's been over and over and over. I married a second husband who was equally abusive, even worse mm-hmm. than my first husband. Yeah. And, they and, felt notice hey. that, and notice that when you weren't in a marriage that you did right. pretty well at abusing yourself, right? Yes, constantly. Yeah. And I still do, constantly. 
I can't well, we'll ask you to do some worksheets on that because what you deserve right. is to function as and to experience the awesome after presence of love that you are as a human being. Right. So I'm so blank tired of all this. Oh, I hear you loud and clear. I'm glad you are. <laughs> I really, ha- I really want to get through it. I just don't want to be walking around with all this shit and pain and anger and rage in myself. None of which well, I've never been able to speak about because it wasn't appropriate. Right. I hear you. So I so- just want express my gratitude to Julie for spending her time and she actually sat in her car talking and it was so cold here yesterday and I also want to express my thanks to you and I want to express my thanks to the other Julie who I don't even know and I see how Notice how loved and appreciated you are. Somebody sat in a cold car to support you and work you through this process. That's so awesome. (laughs) Julie, you are awesome. Both Julies. Oh, what a relief it is. And you open a window for everybody on the planet that has this issue. (laughs) And guess what? It's just about everybody. Now, there's a there's a wonderful song about Vincent Van Gogh, and uh, one of the key lines in that song is, and this world was never meant for one as beautiful as you. <laughs> and the truth is, this world was meant this for what? each one of us as beautiful human beings that we are, and the insanity has taken over and driven that into the ground. And so I, for one, thank you for being willing to confront, to face, and to work through this, and to step out the other side free of that belief that was such a lie and so false and has been a lie and false all of your life. I acknowledge you for your courage to step through that and clean that one up because you open an energy window on planet Earth for everybody (laughs) who has that issue to get free of it. And that's just just a monumental gift. It's a bottom line basic for me. I just really, like, opened up the floodgates of, oh, my God, that's where it all came from. I didn't deserve. Yeah. Yeah. So now, have you done the worksheet? Or, you know, you may do many worksheets around this, but have you done the worksheets around uh, dad not being there to protect you? Because that's another com- important component of this, is that oh. you, you can't have men in your life that you can trust <clears throat> on me to support you because your dad didn't support you. Your dad, you know, right. and it may be that the truth is your dad was awesomely supportive, but that one event, that one experience where it became... You know, around that one issue, it became dad isn't there to protect me and support me, which means men won't be there to protect me and support me. And that's what I have found all my life, that men weren't there at all, ever, and I couldn't trust them either. Yeah. So here's how the world works. It's all called make-believe. First you make it up, then you believe it, and then you go out and you produce evidence to prove that it's true. Right. And notice you've got ample evidence. Right. And time to give it up. Right. So you are just awesomely right on track. <laughs> and I and, and it's gonna be really important for you to do those worksheets around that. Okay. And I see how that rage which I never expressed came out in 
so much judgment against other people, came out in judgment against my children, came out yeah. in judgment, it's just like... Well, you were following... You are following your power person dynamic. Remember that if we're functioning out of carbon-based memory, there are only three possible behaviors. Carbon-based memory, this storage device with its emotional pain from the past, will always guide us to do three things, and that is all based on the power person dynamic. When there's no stress, you'll do whatever your power person did. Pardon me. When, you're, when there's no stress, you'll do whatever you did to get along with your power person. When stress starts to build, you'll do whatever you did to resist and survive with your power person. When you become ultra-stressed, you'll do whatever your power person did that you hated the most. And yes, that would be exactly what you do to your children, just like your mother passed it on to you. So be careful lest you choose to blame your mother because your mother was just passing on a power person dynamic that was given to her. That's right. how it works. That's how it works. And so look at this. You're breaking the chain, not only for, not only opening the energetic window for all of humanity to break this chain, but you're opening the energetic window in your own bloodline. Change this dynamic. And, of course, to, to the other end of it will be that once you feed that to your children, then they're going to spend their lives turning around and feeding it back to you. That's just like the cycle continues. Say that again, please. Once you pass this dynamic on to your children, as you as your mother passed it on to you, the way she got it from her mother, who got it from, who got it from, who got it from, then once your children grow and that's been passed to them, then they're going to turn around and feed it right back to you. They're going to give it right back to you in spades. And they do. And they do. Yes, I know. <laughs> they have no choice. That's what's in carbon-based memory. Until they wake up fully into who they are as human beings, there's no choice. They they can't do anything but feed it back to you because that's all that's there. And so when human life shows up, now you bring something new into the family system. You bring in approval. You bring in this awesome acknowledgement of who you are and who your children are as human beings. And you can start to introduce and speak language that perhaps they've never heard before in the context of a parental relationship. And you can forgive the rest. Remove it from your structure. And I'm talking about right down to and including removing it from your genetics. And as you remove it from your genetics, you open the energetic window for your mother to be free of it. Whether she's in her body or not doesn't matter. She still carries that energy, that frequency. As you forgive it, then you free the whole bloodline, the whole family system. And you can get about something different. Well, it's very obvious, Michael, to me at my age that I'm sick and tired of carrying this pain around, and I want to be happy before I die. Well, you got my support, and and be, be aware, be careful that you don't get focused on how sick and tired you are, or you'll become more sick and tired. Okay. Like, okay, I've had enough. I'm ready to be done with this, so I'm going to move through this. Right. It comes to peace. Okay. Awesome. Well, I, I see where you're seven. You know, Yeshua, when they asked Yeshua, well, how many worksheets do we have to do around this? He said 77 <laughs> times 70. I see this may be one of your 77 times 70 issues that you'll get to work on, you know, seeing as how your mom isn't here anymore. Your children will probably trigger it for you. People around you will trigger it. And as you keep remembering that, whenever you're in upset, it's because you have a goal it causes your mind to build your reality about self out of corrupt data. And that reality is a limited picture from carbon-based memory. It's made of a little tiny framework, nine bits of data. Out of a possible 10,000 brain cells are firing 
your mind selects according to your goal that nine bits of data and produces that as your reality. And your mind has habituated that all your life, and who knows, you know, if we were to imagine this dynamic happening between mother and daughter, mother and daughter for how many generations, who knows when the last time was somebody in your bloodline actually stepped into life as an awesome presence of love and was acknowledged for that. Who knows how long that's been? And you might be the first one in a thousand generations that's been able to do that. And that's a pretty awesome gift to give the world and to give yourself. Right. Well, Michael, you know, when it comes down to my reality, too, I am so unbelievably proud of myself that I'm doing this work and I've been doing work for years to understand who I am because I never learned even how to talk until recently, I mean maybe 20 years ago. So that I ha- that I stayed here on this planet, that I have perseverance and I have a willingness, you know, I'm very proud of those things. And that That's will pretty carry- awesome. Yes. So thank you, thank you for your support. And um, oh man, you got it in spades. That's just so <laughs> fabulous and so awesome. Congratulations, well, young lady. Thank you so much. All right, lots of love and blessings. Thank you, Mike. We look forward to keeping in contact with you. Okay, you will hear me. I'm not leaving again. So notice notice that your speech talks about your unconscious intention, and your unconscious intention is to leave again. Okay. If you were going to create something different, what would your speech be? I'm going to stay and be here and get this work done. Awesome. Awesome. You got it, lady. Okay. And that, you know, that's just what you just said. You don't know how big that is, how monumental what you just said is. Because you know what most people do when I feed back their regulatory speech like I just did to you? You know what most people do when I say, what's the alternative? They go, um, uh, uh, well, I don't know. I, I, I just don't want to leave. Yeah, but what would be the alternative? I mean, you just, with clarity, stepped into a whole new speech pattern. That's major. That really speaks of the the quality of the work that you're doing to be able to do that. Because I'll tell you, over 45 years of working with people, 99.9% of the time, like I, I remember working with one woman and she had a problem with, with money. And all she could think about is, I just never have enough. I just never have enough. And when I confronted that speech and I said, well, you know, notice that you're talking about what you don't have. How, what would your language look like to talk about what you do have? I spent 10 minutes pumping her and she couldn't simply think the thought, oh, I have lots of money. I'm, I'm well taken care of. She, her mind couldn't go there. She was so stuck in what she didn't want. So that's really a fabulous piece of maker, piece of work. So congratulations. Thank you, my dear. All right, young lady. Well, we appreciate you. Happy, wondrous holidays, and have the best year yet of your eternal life. We look forward to sharing it with you. Take care, and Jean's got another caller for us, though. Jeannie, okay. tell us who we're speaking with. What area code have we got? Awesome. We actually have five callers online. The first one is 760. You're on the air. Hi, Michael. Okay, we've got about 30 minutes, so five callers. Let's go for it. Welcome. Oh, who hi, Michael. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Palm Springs, California. I got your number from a friend of mine in Jordan, Israel, and I have been to the Ozark Mountains here in a really wonderful place. Uh, I'd like to, I love the way the circles work on the place. I'd like to it. talk to you about uh, my uh, my uh, dog just died, and uh, I did get a, a, a rescue. Uh, but before I go into her, um, I just found out that I uh, yeah. breathe. Yeah, breathe. Good. 
I've been feeding like him lot, tuna for. I've been feeding him tuna for a couple of years, and I just found out it was high in mercury. Yeah. And I think I killed him. Well, you know, you know, one of the things that we focus on with this work is the fact that the mind has very limited perspectives. And let me just take a wild guess here. When you were a kid, in relationship to your power person, we just talked about power person, the person who had more power in her life than you did, were you always the one that was to blame? I was severely beaten as a kid when my mother died, and I was a teenage runaway, and that's why this rescue dog was also severely beaten and abandoned, and that's why I got her, so that we could help heal one another. Right. Cool. So now, notice that your mind defaults to. Yeah, but I'm a blaming reality. myself for killing my right. dog. Right. That's that's what I'm I'm offering you. Notice that your mind defaults to I'm to blame. So, this is going to be maybe your 77 times 70 worksheet issue. So here's my input to you. You didn't kill your dog. In order to have killed your dog, you'd have had to take in a gun or a knife or thrown him off a bridge, or done something to actively kill him. What you did was, in good faith, you fed your dog tuna. That's all you did. Was there yeah. mercury in it? Is it, in, is it insane that we did it? I didn't know there was mercury in it. Why does the yeah. FDA make them put that on the label? Well, it's pretty insane. But But notice that what your mind does with, I fed my dog what I thought was good food, and there's something wrong with that food, if, if in fact, that was what killed your dog. He had all but, the symptoms. I checked it online and researched it. My rescue dog's trainer told me about the mercury, and I knew instantly that that's what I had done. Yeah. So, so you didn't do that. What you did was you fed your dog good food that you thought would be good for him. That's what you did. Yeah. Yeah. But your mind goes the next step and makes the reality up. Look at this. Once again, I'm to blame. So I'd offer that your worksheet process. Have you done any of the worksheets yet? I I just I I just found out about you about twenty minutes ago. Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad you're here. So I'm gonna suggest you go to www.whyagain.com and up in the upper left or pardon me, dot org. Up in the upper left-hand corner, there's a link that says, start here. Go in and read Chapter 24 of my book. It's free. You can just download it on your computer. Then there's a worksheet process. And then there are five radio shows, and each of the radio shows are an hour long where we walk somebody through the forgiveness process. Your 77 times 70 worksheet issue I would offer is going to be to remove from your mind the belief that you're always to blame and it's always your fault. It's not your fault that the dog died. You, in good faith, fed your dog good food. Is somebody responsible for that? Yes, somebody's responsible for the people who are polluting the planet. Could you pursue that and hold them accountable? If it were your place to do that, that might be something to do. But the first order of business is to clear out of your mind the old reality that no matter what goes wrong, I'm to blame. You're not to blame. Are you responsible for feeding your dog uh, tuna? Yes. And that was done in good faith. It's not your fault. But your mind can make it up that way. Notice this is not a new reality for you. If you look at all the things that have ever gone wrong in your life over the last year, two years, five years, ten years, when the stress is up and the chips are down and something has gone quote-unquote wrong, Here's what I guarantee has happened. You're to blame, right? And that's a from a childhood negative yeah. dynamic. That's that's a power person dynamic. If you if you get our video codependence to interdependence, we go into that whole dynamic. So so that's what your mind defaults to because that's the content of your mind. The forgiveness process, as opposed to letting somebody off the hook or, you know, I'm going to forgive myself for killing my dog. The forgiveness process is 
I'm going to apply forgiveness to the part of my mind that hallucinates the, that I'm to blame for everything. I'm going to remove that so that I could say something that's out of place in my world and I can go, well, you know, I've done my best, I'm innocent, and what do I need to do now? Instead, I Assign blame to, to the people that polluted yeah. the ocean. Well, actually, you don't even have to assign blame to them. You can, again, if you chose to, if it were a situation that you were motivated to, you could hold them accountable. And because of the way, you know, if you, when you look at the reality management worksheet, the forgiveness process, you'll see that it's called a no-fault empowerment process. And that no-fault means we're not looking to assign fault, guilt, and blame. Those things are all of the non-being world and are self-perpetuating. They will just keep the insanity going. If somebody's done something that's out of place, do I want to blame them? No. But do I want to hold them accountable if their behavior's been off base? Absolutely. But blame doesn't have a place in it because blame comes from a place of victimhood. And we're in a place of victimhood. We just short-circuited the whole possibility of ever functioning as a sane human being. We can yeah. function inside of this culture, but the culture is basically insane. You know, you look at the rage, the grief, the guilt, the fear that's going on. The whole thing is insane. <clears throat> Pardon me. What we need to do is get to a point where we wake up and bring forward human life, bring forward sanity. So I come to you. There's an awesome scene. If you haven't seen the movie Gandhi, there's an awesome scene in Gandhi where, you know, he's been put in jail. His countrymen have been beaten, abused, robbed, ripped off, destroyed, shattered, obliterated by the British. Mm -hmm. You know, this is like this is especially the British wherever they go. And they're still doing it today through America, sadly. But you look at what happened to the Native American, you look at what happened to the Aboriginals in, in uh, Australia. I mean it's just it's just the game that happens. So so Gandhi in India is in a prison cell. And he finally gets called into the office because he won't fight. He won't do the hostility and fear game. He functions as love and simply, in a loving way, refuses to cooperate and support their insanity. And they're frustrated and they don't know what to do with him. They've put him in prison and they still can't beat him. So he comes into Colonel Smuts's office. Smuts is the guy who's the the high command, he's the, the head honcho in, in Britain, or in England, in mm -hmm. India, or the British. And he, he's called into his presence to meet with him, and he greets him as a, an equal human being, as a brother. And then he says, and I hope this doesn't come between us as man, but I can't cooperate with your insanity. He doesn't blame him for being insane. He recognizes that he's trapped in the same insanity that virtually everybody in the world is trapped in. In fact, there's another great scene in the movie where it shows Gandhi's insanity toward his wife and how he goes into this rage and he catches himself and, and says, like, <clears throat> I need to change this dynamic in my life. And he does. And he defeats the whole British Empire which no, number, no amount of guns could ever do because he functioned out of love. He functioned out of his higher spiritual faculties. So if there's somebody that needs to be held accountable, and, you know, if it's your job, maybe you're the person who's going to spearhead out of the genius mind of your human beingness, the changing of the fact that we're dumping so much mercury into children's bodies and into the ocean and pretending that it's okay. Maybe, maybe that's your job. I don't know. But I would suggest if you're going to do that, that you clean out your pain around the atrocities that have happened as a result of that, and you come mm -hmm. to it with the genius mind of your human beingness as you come to yourself with the genius mind of your human beingness, and you will stop the pollution. And then I'm crush it hold with grief. Exactly. If you approach it with grief, your intelligence will be reduced and chances of being successful will be slim to none. The, the, you know, the Yeshua talked about a house divided against himself. If I'm divided against myself, in my head I'm saying one thing, but in my heart I'm saying another, then I'm a contributor. So if I have grief and pain, if I have aberrant energy around a particular issue that I want to see change, by going and approaching that situation, that 
I actually contribute that aberrant energy to that situation, and I'm a supporter of it. Even though in my head I'm saying I want that to end. That's called a house divided against itself. So the first order mm-hmm. of business is I go in and do my work. I clean it up. I come as a space of love and say, you know, what you're doing isn't right, so I'm going to do what I need to do to hold you accountable. Love you like a brother. Hope this doesn't come between us as men, but your way of doing business is going down. Well, I was given your number mainly due to the rescue dog that I just rescued. She won't let anybody pet her or anything. And I understand her past pain because mine is almost identical. And their chances were like 99.9% of finding a home for this dog. They did a viral video and sent it out, which was very misleading. And... I was misled up until the day I went to pick her up in Los Angeles. And uh, she's doing better, but I will never be able to take her in public as she is. And, uh, you know, she's just really damaged. And uh, I would never think about returning her, but uh, my friend in Israel said that you could help me on, on that issue. Well, here's my input on that one. You know, one of the things, when I had a private practice, one of the things I noticed that when people um, had animals, that oftentimes their animals would die of the diseases they had three to four years before the owner did. And I've checked with vets, and they've gone, oh, my God, I've never thought of that, but yes. So we are energetic beings. This dog is in your life for a perfect reason. And as you clean up and forgive, and I'm suggesting you really, truly Take that tool and use it as you remove that pain and that mistreatment and that fear that comes from abuse in you. You can do the reverse of what most people do with their animals is set up the energy of their diseases. You can reverse that by undoing that pain and trauma in you by forgiving that, and you can choose to do that. The animal can't choose to do that. But if you do it as the animal's owner, then you create a space you mean I should forgive my father for beating me? Okay. I'm going to suggest you never forgive your father for beating you. Not in the next million years. No. Never forgive him. Okay. You may choose to pardon him. You may choose to say, you know, Dad, that was pretty insane. You know, like, a, were you on the show for our last caller? Yes. You hear? Okay. So you noticed that she had a certain behavior that came from her mother, and she passed yes. it on to her children. Yes. Now, in a million years, there's no mother that would pass it on to their child, except that that's all they had in them. So what I guarantee is your dad came from a home where he was verbally, mentally, physically, and or emotionally abused. And so that's what's in him to pass on. I remember working with a young man back about uh, 20 years ago, and <clears throat> this kid grew up without a father, and he was just rageful at the fact that his father left. And he was an adult. After he started using this, these tools and working with his work, he went looking for his father and found him. And all his rage at his father was just right on the surface. And when yeah. he found his father, his father in tears explained to him how he had been very badly abused as a child. And he realized that the only thing he would be able to give his son was abuse and that it was better to leave him uh-huh. than it was to abuse him. Well, my dad did die a few years back, and I uh, I don't feel quite as the anger has left me, but I don't forgive him at all. So, so you see, our, our world has taught us a false idea of forgiveness. I let you off the hook for what's happening inside of me. So if you choose to pardon your father, okay, Dad, I realize you're a product of your environment. You passed it on, and I've passed some of it on, too. So now what I'm going to do is I choose to pardon you. I'm going to let you off the hook for that, and now I'm going to apply forgiveness inside of me to remove my pain. As I apply forgiveness inside of me to remove my pain, I open the energy window to bleed, so to speak, that energy off of my dog and help my dog to remove it. And together we get free of that rather than Uh engaging in more trauma. So that would be my vote for you is take the worksheet process, Listen to some of the shows where we've walked people through it. Yeah. I have unlimited calling, so I, I will. I will do that. Awesome. 
So jump on the website, whyagain.org, download the worksheet, download some of the radio shows, give them a listen. And then as you do the worksheet process and questions come up, because it's a totally different way of thinking, uh, then please call the show and just ask the question. We're here to support you 100%. That's awesome. Thank you, Michael. All right. Love and blessings to you. Nice to meet you. Blessings. Bye-bye. We open the space for you to create the best year yet of your eternal life. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Jeannie, you've got a caller for us? We do. Area code 765, you're on the air. 765, welcome to the show. Hi, Michael. This is Sunny. I have a new guest here. I'm going to be very brief. Um, I guess I'm a little confused with the gentleman who just spoke, if his dog is, in fact, still alive. Um, He can potentially heal his dog. There are options. Well, 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 he's... What 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 happened is that his dog died of mercury poisoning, and he's got a new dog, a rescue that was badly abused. So that's what he's talking about uh, dealing okay. with there. Okay, and then I really wanted to thank the um, the grandmother who called in, and that's a Native yes. American expression. I want to thank her and let her know that if she's still online, that this is she was such a gift to me in my same mm. body. And nice. We all have a potential of 120 years of life and living, and I think you may have pointed out to her that if she continues to do this work, she'll be restored in her youth and in so many aspects of life. And I thank you, Michael, and I'm going to hand you over to my dear friend James, not the same Jim, but my dear friend James, who I'm just introducing to you. He has a question. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. And by the way, as far as that uh, potential for 120 years, Excuse me, but we have records of people who lived 800, 900, and 1,000 years. Our potential yes, exactly. is eternal, eternal. Exactly. That exactly. 120 limit is a lie. She is still beautiful, a vibrant, beautiful young woman, and she's got a whole new birthday. <laughs> yes. So, All thanks, right, Michael. let's talk to James. Hi, Michael. How are you? I'm blessed and highly favored. How about you, James? I'm doing pretty good. Um, I just have a, a question. I've, uh, I'm okay. a pra- practitioner of alternative medicine and the healing arts, and, and a lot of the time it's incredibly difficult to apply what we, we teach other people or what we recommend to other people to our own lives. And I know um, Oh, yeah, and I, I'm very guilty. And uh, one of the things that I've recently done was um, I was, uh, you know, just I was dealing with a lot of issues that went on for about five years with addiction and other things. And I've completely cleaned up my act, and I, well, not completely. I still smoke cigarettes, but as far you know, as far as anything else, I mean, that's that's the extent of it. But I managed to get myself into a position where, you know, when I stopped my uh, insanity, you know, it was in, in it, it got to the point where either I was going to die or I was going to stop doing what I was doing. So I stopped. Right. And and yeah. and it's been you know, oh God, you know, several months now that I've you know had complete sobriety, sanity, and happiness, which you know I'm very thankful for. But the issue that I'm having is that I'm having difficulty motivating myself still to do the things that are beneficial for me, you know, making, you know, being proactive in my own life to make sure that I'm uplifting myself as much as I desire for the people that I'm helping to be uplifted in their lives. And my question is, you know, what can we do as healers to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves in a way that isn't selfish, but we're maintaining an organism that can be of benefit to other people for many years to come? Right. Okay. So, so one of the things that um, that uh, we need to do is really watch our words. And I so I listen carefully. And why would a person who's so guilty take care of themselves? Mm-hmm. The basic bottom line of your life is, as with our last caller, that seems to be our theme today. I'm guilty, I'm to blame. Notice your, the opening words were how guilty you were. Mm. So so my take, my offering to you would be the first order of business is going to be to forgive, that is take the reality management worksheet that I'm sure that uh, young lady can share with you and look at to apply that tool to the guilt that you hold. That's one of the basic bottom line beliefs about yourself. And as you remove that, then you'll tap into the worthiness 
and the natural inclination to go toward what supports you. Because maybe you could put your mute button on. We're getting a little bit of feedback. So, and then when you want to talk again, just undo your mute button if you would. But, but as long as you're guilty, there's a certain self-image of what you deserve and what you don't deserve. And if that's the underlying reality you hold about yourself, then until that reality is undone, you're never going to be able to act consistently with your whole being. And the forgiveness process isn't about letting somebody else off the hook because I feel guilty. You know, somebody will say, well, when you said that, you really made me feel guilty. Well, I can't feel guilty unless I have a reality in my mind called guilt. If I want to be free of my guilt, then I apply forgiveness to my guilt to remove it. And when I've removed it, then I function as a full human being. So I'd offer that's probably going to be the first order of business, is to, uh, to begin to look at why did I use all of those different drugs to keep myself suppressed and shut down? What was I hiding from myself? Obviously, it had to do with guilt. At least that's one component of it. And now I'm going to apply forgiveness and remove my guilt. Does that make sense for you? It does. Cool. So I suggest whyagain.org. Well, actually, she's got she's got the worksheets there, uh, I, and I'm I'm getting ready actually to send in the next probably hour or so to send a new worksheet to put on the website uh, for Jeannie to uh, to put on the website. So if she's got the space, it'll maybe be on the website within the next couple of hours, and uh, there are a few little tiny uh, tweaks in it. But take that and start to use it and put yourself in number one A as the object of attention, and you know, because of the way I've lived my life, I'm guilty is the situation. So what's the feeling, guilt? What's the thought? You know, whatever's beneath the guilt. Uh, I'm not good enough. I should have done it better might be the thought. Uh, what's the punishment thought? Uh, well, you know, I'll just puke on myself. I'll just, uh, you know, step outside of what I know will create health for me. And then what's the goal? Well, I want to feel good about myself. I want to be loving toward myself and go into, I cancel that goal. Well, why would I cancel a goal that's so wonderful as I deserve to be loved? Because in your file on being loved, what's locked in there is guilt. And the, the goal, and this is the trick of forgiveness out of the Aramaic that isn't existent anywhere else on the planet, and that's why most of the planet's playing this game of, you made me. It's all everybody else's fault, so we've been taught to forgive them. We counsel never forgive anybody. Apply forgiveness to your rage, your grief, your fear, your hatred, your vengeance, your pain, and get free of it. Then embody as a human being, and the fireworks start to happen. That's where we're designed to go. So I'll suggest you pick up that worksheet, start to apply it in that arena, and keep in touch with us. And more questions, refinements on it, pick up the phone, call us, and we'll support you. Great. Thank you. Bless you, Michael. <laughs> Okay, and Michael, right. very, very quickly, when we um, go through our worksheets, do we get our, like, mind shifter material from the feelings, the thoughts, and the punishment stuff? You can get the mind shifter material from everything. And actually, there's an awesome tool that somebody uh, introduced to the work at an intensive a while back. And what she did was she took her goal at the end of the worksheet, number seven, her goal that comes from conscious, active, present love, and use that as a mind shifter. And you'll find that very effective and very useful. So your your, your number seven goal is then your mind yes. shifter, your mantra. Turn that into a mind shifter, yes. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Blessings. All the space. Yes. Hi, Jeannie, you've got another call for us? You know, we yes. haven't had Excellent. to send the oldest, the oldest, have... oldest him or David yet. I actually have uh Okay. Thank you. Awesome. All right, thank you. Blessings. All the space. Yeah. Hey, Jeannie, you've got you. another caller for us? You know, we yes. haven't had actually, to send the oldest I I have, him or David yet. I actually have uh two more callers but we're down to about four minutes. The next one is okay, area code five four five four one, you're on the air. Hi, it's Julie from Ashland. I just will be hey, brief. Um, awesome, awesome, uh, awesome program. Um, 
I wanted to mention with Carolyn, who was on first, um, that she had a little bit of a notion um, when she was looking at all this work that is ahead of her to do that she is the root cause of the carbon-based memory. And I'd like, I, I was thinking you might differ on that and maybe offer a little light so she doesn't feel like this is a, that kind of a load. So well, I think you did carbon, touch carbon upon it at the end. Yeah. Let's just take a second and talk about carbon-based memory. Carbon-based memory is the fact that our cellular structure made of carbon stores every thought, every feeling, every reality that comes to it, and it's stored holographically in every cell so that it's passed on to future generations. So to recognize that you inherited a body-mind unit, what's called a body-mind unit, it's not physical really, it's an energetic system, but you inherited an energetic system that had all of these aberrant energies in it before you even got here. And as you recognize that, then you have the opportunity to forgive, that is to remove those energies so that you're free of them and get on with the true functioning as a human being living out of a human life. So carbon-based memory is the it's, – it's like – you know, I go to the store and I buy a computer and there are bugs in the computer. There are viruses in the computer. Am I to blame for that? No, it's just what's in the computer. So we all come into this world and we have a genetic component, a device that sadly is oftentimes filled with all kinds of garbage. And the forgiveness process is about removing the garbage so that our device functions as it was originally designed to function, as this awesome human life that we're supposed to be or designed to be living out of. Does that make sense of your question? Is that what you were thinking in terms of, Julie? I was on mute. Um, yeah, yeah, because was, she was tending to feel a, a burden and like she caused it all. And just to keep that perspective of nobody quite is the owner of where it all began, yet we yes, do need to look responsibly. But, but that's another good, and we've only got a few seconds left, so I'm going to have to close out. But that's another good worksheet is I'm responsible for it all, for everything that's wrong. Because the truth is you're not but you can okay. take responsibility for whatever's in there, and you can dissolve it. And we're down to about 45 seconds, so we're going to have to close the show up. But this would be a good conversation to continue tomorrow. And our other caller, I apologize if we didn't get to you, but call in right at the beginning of the show, and we'll see if we get you first in queue. And we'll look forward to speaking with you, and we hold a space for the best year yet of your eternal life. Happy holidays, and uh, bring a stranger to the show tomorrow.